finding a research topic. The learning objectives for this section are learn some common sources of research ideas, define the research literature in psychology and give examples of sources that are part of the research literature and sources that are not, and describe and use several methods for finding previous research on a particular research idea or question. Good research must begin with a good research question. Yet, coming up with good research questions is something that novice researchers often find difficult and stressful. One reason is that it is a creative process that can appear mysterious or even magical with experienced researchers seeming to pull interesting research questions out of thin air. However, psychological research on creativity has shown that it is neither as mysterious nor as magical as it appears. It is largely the product of ordinary thinking strategies and persistence. This section covers some fairly simple strategies for finding general research ideas, turning those ideas into empirically testable research questions, and finally evaluating those questions in terms of how interesting they are and how feasible they would be to answer. Finding inspiration. Research questions often begin as more general research ideas, usually focusing on some behavioral or psychological characteristic talkativeness, learning, depression, bungee jumping, and so on. Before looking at how to turn such ideas into empirically testable research questions, it is worth looking at where such ideas come from in the first place. Three of the most common sources of inspiration are informal observations, practical problems, and previous research. Informal observations include direct observations of our own and others' behavior, as well as secondhand observations from non-scientific sources, such as newspapers, books, blogs, and so on. For example, you might notice that you always seem to be in the slowest moving line at the grocery store. Could it be that most people think the same thing? Or you might read in a local newspaper about people donating money and food to a local family whose house has burned down and begin to wonder about who makes such donations and why. Some of the most famous research in psychology has been inspired by informal observations. Stanley Milgram's famous research on obedience to authority, for example, was inspired in part by journalistic reports of the trials of accused Nazi war criminals, many of whom claimed that they were only obeying orders. This led him to wonder about the extent to which ordinary people will commit immoral acts simply because they're ordered to do so by an authority figure. Practical problems can also inspire research ideas, leading directly to applied research in such domains as law, health, education, and sports. Does taking lecture notes by hand improve students' exam performance? How effective is psychotherapy for depression compared to drug therapy? To what extent do cell phones impair people's driving ability? How can we teach children to read more efficiently? What is the best mental preparation for running a marathon? Probably the most common inspiration for new research ideas, however, is previous research. Recall that science is kind of a large scale collaboration in which many different researchers read and evaluate each other's work and conduct new studies to build on it. Of course, experienced researchers are familiar with previous research in their area of expertise and probably have a long list of ideas. This suggests that novice researchers, like you, can find inspiration by consulting with a more experienced researcher. For example, students can consult a faculty member. But you can also find inspiration by picking up a copy of almost any professional journal and reading the titles and abstracts. In one typical issue of psychological science, for example, you can find articles on the perception of shapes, anti-Semitism, police lineups, the meaning of death, second language learning, people who seek negative emotional experiences, and many other topics. If you can narrow your interest down to a particular topic, for example, memory, or domain, for example, healthcare, you can also look through more specific journals, such as memory and cognition or health psychology. Let's take a look at another video um, that's going to show us a little bit more about this. In this video, you will learn how to develop a good research topic. 
To start out, let's first answer the question why it's important to know how to develop a good research topic. Think of it this way. During your time as a student, and perhaps even later, you will probably write a good number of research papers. While some instructors might provide you with a list of research topics to choose from, others might not. You will have to choose your own topic. So, what can you write about? Well, let's first answer the question, what makes a topic really good? Three things worth to mention here. First, it's a topic that strongly interests you. This is very important. Make sure that the topic you pick, the topic you will write about, is a topic that interests you, fascinates you, that you want to talk about. Really, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of time writing about a topic that bores you. Second, make sure your topic is creative. What do we mean by that? Well, there are some topics that have just been written about over and over and over again. Can you come up with a topic that perhaps hasn't been covered that much? Try to pick something that is creative and exciting to you and your peers. Writing about Shakespeare's dramas is great, but that topic in itself has been covered extensively. So try to find something that might be a little more creative than that. And third, speaking of Shakespeare's dramas, make sure you pick something that is not too broad. Look at your assignment prompt. How many pages are you supposed to write? If you get a five-page paper as an assignment, well, Shakespeare's dramas is just going to be a little bit too broad. So make sure that the topic you choose fits the scope of your paper. Sometimes it can be really difficult to find a topic that is not too broad. Here are a couple of words of advice on what to do when your topic seems too broad. Let's say you are in an environmental science class. Your teacher gives you this assignment prompt. Write a research paper on the topic dealing with a current environmental issue. Your paper should not exceed five pages and should be based on a topic that strongly interests you. Well, you say, that's no problem. I know exactly what to write about. I saw the show the other day on TV and it talked about the effects of deforestation on gorillas in Africa. I think that's a great topic. I know it interests me, and it's creative. So, let's write about it. Well, not so fast. Remember, your paper is only supposed to be five pages. How are you going to fit that topic into a five-page paper? That's going to be difficult. So what could you do instead? The key is to add more context. For example, you could add some geographical context to your paper. Is there a geographic region or country in which gorillas are specifically affected by deforestation? Perhaps you want to focus more on a historical context. Is there a certain time aspect you want to write about? Perhaps the time when deforestation really started to affect gorillas. And third, with this topic, you could also add biological context. Perhaps there's a specific subspecies of the gorilla that you're interested to write about. So when we combine all three contexts and incorporate them into the original topic, this is what we get. Something like current effects of deforestation on the mountain gorilla in southwest Uganda. We thereby incorporate the historical context the biological context, and the geographical context. Adding context truly is a great way of narrowing your topic. In this video, Reviewing the research literature. Once again, one of the most common sources of inspiration is previous research. Therefore, it's important to review the literature early in the research process. The research literature in any field is all the published research in that field. Reviewing the research literature means finding, reading, and summarizing the published research relevant to your topic of interest. 
In addition to helping you discover new questions, reviewing the research literature early in the research process can help you in several other ways. It can tell you if a research question has already been answered. It can help you evaluate the interestingness of a research question. It can give you ideas for how to conduct your own study. And it can tell you how your study fits into the research literature. The research literature in psychology is enormous, including millions of scholarly articles and books dating to the beginning of the field, and it continues to grow. Although its boundaries are somewhat fuzzy, the research literature definitely does not include self-help and other pop psych books, dictionaries and encyclopedia entries, websites, and similar sources that are intended mainly for the general public. These are considered unreliable because they're not reviewed by other researchers and are often based on little more than common sense or personal experience. Wikipedia contains much valuable information but because its authors are anonymous and may not have any formal training or expertise in that subject area, and its content continually changes, it's unsuitable as a basis of a sound scientific research. For our purposes, it helps to define the research literature as consisting almost entirely of two types of sources, articles in professional journals and scholarly books in psychology and related fields. So types of publications. Professional journals. Professional journals are periodicals that publish original research. There are thousands of professional journals that publish research in psychology and related fields. They're usually published monthly or quarterly in individual issues, each of which contains several articles. The issues are organized into volumes, which usually consist of all the issues for a calendar year. Some journals are published in hard copy only, others in both hard copy and electronic form, and still others in electronic form only. Most articles in professional journals are one of two basic types, empirical research reports and review articles. Empirical research reports describe one or more new empirical studies conducted by the authors. Keep in mind empirical means based on observation. This means they introduce a research question, explain why it's interesting, review the previous research, describe their method and results, and draw their conclusions. Review articles, on the other hand, summarize previously published research on a topic and usually present new ways to organize or explain the results. When a review article is devoted primarily to presenting a theory, it is often referred to as a theoretical article. When a review article provides a statistical summary of all of the previous results, it is referred to as a meta-analysis. Most professional journals in psychology undergo a process of double-blind peer review. Researchers who want to publish their work in the journal submit a manuscript to the editor, who's generally an established researcher too, who in turn sends it to two or three experts on that topic. Each reviewer reads the manuscript, writes a critical but constructive review, and sends the review back to the editor along with recommendations about whether the manuscript should be published or not. The editor then decides whether to accept the article for publication, asks the authors to make changes and resubmit it for further uh, consideration, or they reject it outright. In any case, the editor forwards the reviewer's written comments to the researchers so that they can revise their manuscript accordingly. This entire process is double blind, as the reviewers do not know the identity of the researcher, and the researcher doesn't know the identity of the reviewers. Double blind peer review is helpful because it ensures that the work meets basic standards of the field before it can enter the research literature. However, in order to increase transparency and accountability, some newer open access journals, for example, Frontiers in Psychology, utilize an open peer review process, wherein the identities of the reviewers, which re remain concealed during the peer review process, are published alongside the journal article. Scholarly books. Scholarly books are written, uh, they're books written by researchers and practitioners, mainly for use by other researchers and practitioners. A monograph is written by a single author or a small group of authors 
and usually gives a coherent presentation of a topic, much like an extended review article. Edited volumes have an editor or a small group of editors who recruit many authors to write separate chapters on different aspects of the same topic. Although edited volumes can also give a coherent presentation of the topic, it's not unusual for each chapter to take a different perspective, or even for the authors of different chapters to openly disagree with each other. In general, scholarly books undergo a peer review process similar to that used by professional journals. Literature search strategies using PsycInfo and other databases. The primary method used to search the research literature involves using one or more electronic databases. These include Academic Search Premier, JSTOR, and ProQuest for all academic disciplines, ERIC for education, and PubMed for medicine and related fields. The most important for our purposes, however, is PsycInfo, which is produced by the American Psychological Association, or the APA. PsycInfo is so comprehensive, covering thousands of professional journals and scholarly books going back more than a hundred years, that for most purposes, its content is synonymous with the research literature in psychology. Like most such databases, PsycInfo is usually available through your university library. PsycInfo consists of individual records for each article, book chapter, or book in the database. Each record includes basic publication information, an abstract or summary of the work, like the one presented at the start of this chapter, and a list of other works cited by that work. A computer interface allows entering one or more search terms and returns any records that contain those search terms. These interfaces are provided by different vendors and they can look somewhat different depending on the library we use, so we'll cover these in class. Each record in the database also contains lists of keywords that describe the content of the work and also a list of index terms. The index terms are especially helpful because they're standardized. Research on differences between males and females, for example, is always indexed under, quote, human sex differences. Research on note taking is always indexed under the term, quote, learning strategies. If you do not know the appropriate index terms, PsycInfo includes a thesaurus that can help you find them. Given that there are nearly 4 million records in PsycInfo, you may have to try a variety of search terms in different combinations and at different levels of specificity before you find what you're looking for. Imagine, for example, that you're interested in the question of whether males and females differ in, their uh, sorry, differ in terms of their ability to recall experiences from when they were very young. If you were to enter the search term memory, it would return far too many records to look through individually. This is where the thesaurus helps us. Entering memory in the thesaurus provides several specific index terms, one of which is early memories. While searching for early memories among the index terms still returns too many to look through individually, combining it with human sex differences as a second search term returns fewer articles, many of which are highly relevant to the topic. Depending on the vendor that provides the interface to PsycInfo, you may be able to save, print, or email the relevant PsycInfo records. The records might even contain links to full text copies of the works themselves. PsycArticles is a database that provides full text access to articles in all journals published by the APA. If you can't access the full article and you want a copy of the work, you'll have to find out if the library carries the journal or has the book and the hard copy on the library shelves. You can always ask a librarian if you need help. So here is another video that's going to show us a sample search of PsycInfo. In this tutorial, I'll demonstrate how you can transform your research question into a productive search of the database. First, let's look at our research question. What are the side effects of antipsychotic drugs when used by patients with schizophrenia? We'll start by breaking that question into its core concepts, schizophrenia, and side effects of antipsychotic drugs. First note that I've narrowed my database selection to just PsycInfo for this search. We recommend starting a PsycInfo search with the thesaurus. Because every record in the PsycInfo database is tagged with terms from the thesaurus, 
Using it ensures that you'll find the most relevant research. Our Psych Info indexers also indicate whether a term is major or minor. A major term indicates that the article is primarily about that topic. Choosing major concept will limit the results to just those that have schizophrenia as a major term. When you click the Add button, you see that this is added to the search box at the top of the screen. You could run a search for just that term, but let's continue building our search by adding the next concept, antipsychotic drugs. Note that our search for antipsychotic drugs indicates that the preferred term is neuroleptic drugs. Although different authors over different times may have used either term, selecting the preferred term and adding it to our search will find all research on this topic, regardless of the original term used. And this time, I'll click on the term to see the full record. As you can see, you have the option of adding narrower, broader, and related terms. Because these individual drugs are all relevant to our search, we may want to add them all. We could click the box next to each term, but it's faster and easier to click the Explode box. With that Explode box checked, clicking the Add button will add all of these terms to our search at once. Finally, we'll add our third concept to this search. Our question was not just about neuroleptic drugs, but more specifically, the side effects of those drugs. So let's try searching for side effects in the thesaurus. We see two possibilities, side effects drug and side effects treatment. In this search, we want side effects drug. Adding this term as a major concept completes our search. What are the side effects of antipsychotic drugs when used by patients with schizophrenia? Now we're ready to run this well-crafted search. These results will be right on target for our research. Because we took the time to craft this tailored search, we might want to save it and or set alerts to be notified when new research is added to the PsychInfo database that matches this search criteria. Just click the Alert Save Share button to get started. For more search tips and strategies, please see our YouTube channel or the APA website. Thank you. In, this in addition to entering search terms into PsycInfo and other databases, there are several other techniques you can use to search the research literature. First, if you have one good article or book chapter on your topic, a recent review article is best, you can look through the reference list of that article for other relevant articles, books, and book chapters. This is sometimes called swinging back through the trees or swinging back through the research. In fact, you should do this with any relevant article or book chapter you find. You can also start with a classic article or book chapter on your topic, find its record in PsycInfo by entering the author's name or article's title as a search term, and link from there to a list of other works in PsycInfo that cite that classic article. This works because other researchers working on your topic are likely to be aware of the classic article and cite it in their own work. You can also do a general internet search using search terms related to your topic or the name of a researcher who conducts research on your topic. This might lead you directly to works that are part of the research literature, for example, articles in open access journals or posted on researchers' own websites. The search engine Google Scholar is especially useful for this purpose. A general internet search might also lead you to websites that are not part of the research literature but might provide references to works that are. Finally, you can talk to people, for example, me or other faculty members in psychology, who know something about your topic and can suggest relevant articles and book chapters. So let's watch a quick video on how to use Google Scholar. In this tutorial, you are going to learn how to use Google Scholar. To access Google Scholar, go to scholar.google.com, or if you are already using a Google product, look for Scholar under the More menu. Use Google Scholar to find scholarly articles and books, verify citations, 
and explore more useful and related resources. Let's start with a basic search for information on elephant joints. Enter your terms in the search box, then click the search button. This will search the full text of articles and books in every field of study. You might notice that the results are a little different than in a standard Google search. You will see the article title, publication date, author, journal title, and links to freely available full text. If it's available, free full text will appear to the right of a search result, beginning with the letters HTML or PDF. Let's click on one and see how it works. As you can see, it connected us to the full text on the publisher website. Now let's try clicking on a title that does not show a free PDF or HTML option. Each journal publisher is different, so you'll want to look around for the words full text, which can appear as a link or as a PDF icon. Sometimes you'll get lucky and this will take you to the full article for free. Often you'll be asked to pay for the article at prices between $25 and $50. Do not do it. As a student, you should not have to pay for articles. Your course fees already provide you with extensive library resources, so try those first. Even if your school doesn't have access, you can usually borrow it from another school through a process called interlibrary loan. A newer feature allows your school library to link their resources to Google. This way, Google Scholar will be able to check if your school has access to articles that appear in the results list. To configure Google Scholar for your library resources, go to Scholar Preferences. In the Library Links box, type the name of your college or university. You may need to use an abbreviation. Choose the checkboxes that match. There may be more than one. If you already see some checked for your school, you are already set up. Another option to set in Preferences is to open search results in a new window. This keeps your search results in the current window and opens the articles you click on in new windows or tabs. When finished, be sure to choose Save Preferences. If your school cannot be found in library links, you still have some options. Return to a screen where you can clearly see the article information such as journal title, article title, author, and publication date. Use this information to search your library resources for the article, or ask a librarian if you need help doing this. If you were able to add your school, now you will see a link at the bottom of some search results that says, find it at, or get it at, with your school name or abbreviation. This means that your school has an online or print subscription to this journal title, but that does not guarantee access to the specific volume or issue your article belongs to. Follow the link to find out how to access the article through your school library. You may be asked to log in with your student username and password. Adding your school info to preferences may also give you more full text links to the right of articles. This is because some databases are set up to link to Google Scholar. You can tell that these are different because they will not begin with the letters HTML or PDF but instead with the database name, like EBSCO or Gale. This link will take you to the full text within the database through your school. Not all databases are linked in this way, so be sure to try the Find It links. You may be asked to log in with your student username and password. Like a regular Google search, the results in Scholar can be overwhelming. If your search results number in the several hundreds or thousands, Choose the Advanced Scholar Search option to the right of the search box. You can see that there are several options to narrow your search. Many are the same that you find in a regular Google search, including options like limiting by date. Unique in Google Scholar is the option to specify a specific author or journal title. Another neat feature within Scholar is to choose specific subject areas. 
This is handy when your search terms may be popular in multiple subjects, but you are only interested in one or two. Choose Search Scholar to continue. Notice the Cited By link. This is the number of times Google Scholar has found this article cited in other articles. This can give you some idea of how popular a source is, but you should know that this only includes articles that Google has indexed. This means that it is not an expert or foolproof way to rate the article. Another great use for this feature is to find new sources, especially if this article fits your topic very well. You now have 12 additional articles to consider. Another way to find similar articles is the Related Articles link. Click this and Google will display a list of articles that it has determined to be similar in content. Google determines this by keywords that occur in the articles, if they are published in the same journal, if they are written by the same author, and a number of other factors they keep secret. You may have noticed that in some results the article title is not a link and it shows the word citation in brackets. This means that Google found the article citation listed in a bibliography but was unable to find online access to the article itself. If you are interested in this article, use the provided information to find it at your library. Google Scholar is a great tool to use in addition to library databases. If you need more help using it, or need help tracking down an article, you can always ask a librarian at your school for help. I guess that's the end of that one. <laughs> okay, what to search for. When you do a literature review, you need to be selective. Not every article, book chapter, and book that relates to your research idea or question will be worth obtaining, reading, and integrating into your review. Instead, you want to focus on sources that help you do four basic things. A, refine your research question. B, identify appropriate research methods. C, place your research in the context of previous research. And D, write an effective research report. Several basic principles can help you find the most useful sources. First, it's best to focus on research, recent research, keeping in mind that what counts as recent depends on the topic. For newer topics that are actively being studied, recent might mean published in the past year or two. For older topics that are receiving less attention right now, recent might mean within the past 10 years. You'll get a feel for what counts as recent for your topic when you start your literature search. A good general rule, however, is to start with sources published in the past five years. The main exception to this rule would be classic articles that turn up in the reference list of nearly every other source. If other researchers think that this work is important, even though it's old, then by all means, you should include it in your review. Second, you should look for review articles on your topic because they'll provide a useful overview of it often discussing important definitions, results, theories, trends, and controversies, giving you a good sense of where your own research fits into the literature. You should also look for empirical research reports, addressing your question or similar questions, which can give you ideas about how to measure your variables and collect your data. As a general rule, it's good to use methods that others have already used successfully, unless you have good reasons not to. Finally, you should look for sources that provide information that can help you argue for the interestingness of your research question. For a study on the effects of cell phone use on driving ability, for example, you might look for information about how widespread cell phone use is, how frequent and costly motor vehicle crashes are, and so on. How many sources are enough for your literature review? This is a difficult question because it depends on how extensively your topic has been studied and also on your own goals. One study found that across a variety of professional journals in psychology, the average number of sources cited per article was about 50. This gives a rough idea of what professional researchers consider to be adequate. As a student, you'll probably be assigned a much lower minimum number, I'm not expecting you to read 50 articles and reference them, um, but the principles for selecting the most useful ones remain the same. 